We begin today with an in-depth analysis of the recent Ukrainian strikes on Belgorod, a bold and unexpected escalation that has brought the horrors of war into Russian territory. The repercussions of this attack, both in human terms and strategic implications, signal a potential shift in the dynamics of the whole Ukraine conflict. Then we're going to shift our gaze to the Horn of Africa, where Ethiopia and the breakaway region of Somaliland have inked a groundbreaking agreement. This deal, offering Ethiopia access to a Red Sea port, not only averts a potential conflict, but also reshapes regional alliances and challenges the existing geopolitical status quo. And finally, we're going to focus on the Middle East, where Israel's targeted assassination of a senior Hamas leader in Lebanon marks a significant escalation in its ongoing conflict with Hamas. This incident not only exacerbates regional tensions, but also raises the specter of a broader conflict, with potential implications for the delicate balance of power in the region. So as we navigate through these complex stories, we're going to aim to provide clarity, context, and unravel the threads of these pretty significant events. So let's get started. Now, at first glance, it could have been another tragic day in any number of Ukrainian cities. As plumes of black smoke billowed from burning cars, firefighters rushed the wounded to safety. Buildings bore the scars of shrapnel damage. From closer to the epicenter of the blasts, footage showed terrified pedestrians running for cover. For the people of Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa, and others, scenes like this are sadly commonplace, repeated again and again across the 680 plus days of Vladimir Putin's invasion. Yet the images that emerged on December the 30th weren't from any Ukrainian city, but from Belgorod, a city of 330,000, some 40 kilometers over the border. And the civilians fleeing the explosions, they weren't Ukrainians, they were Russians. Russian civilians who just witnessed the deadliest attack on their soil since the war began. Although Ukrainian mass casualty strikes inside Russia have so far been rare, they're not unheard of. Villages near the border have been shelled, and 2023 even saw Russian rebels backed by Kiev launch brief raids into Moscow's territory. Overall, it's thought up to 50 soldiers and civilians have been killed inside Russia in such attacks. What made the strike on Belgorod so noteworthy, though, was its sheer scale. According to local authorities, the bombing killed 24 civilians and injured around 110. Although Kiev claimed it had been aiming at military targets, not everyone's buying it. The New York Times, for example, noted how, quote, in his overnight address on Friday, President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine said that his country would continue to work toward pushing the war back to where it came from, home to Russia. For his part, Vladimir Putin declared that he was seething, complaining during a visit to a military hospital that, quoting via Politico here, they want to A, intimidate us, and B, create instability in our country. He also vowed to intensify strikes against Ukraine, a promise we've seen play out in real time. Between the 1st and 2nd of January, a wave of missiles and drones hit Kiev and Kharkiv, killing five civilians and leaving scores injured. A hotel in Kharkiv, used by the international media, was gutted by a missile. Closer to the front, cities like Kherson have been shelled. Presented like this, the story of the last few days in the war seems to be one of escalating tit-for-tat atrocities. Indeed, Wednesday morning saw more explosions over Belgorod as 12 Ukrainian missiles were shot down. But while there's likely an element of score settling in these recent strikes, it's not the only thing at work here. Amid the carnage, it might just be possible to sense the outline of new strategies at work. Strategies that could point towards a new direction for the conflict in 2024. This new pattern of attacks started the day before the strike on Belgorod on December the 29th. While for us in the West, the day was likely one of eating Christmas leftovers and avoiding work, for those in Ukraine, it was a day from hell. Over several hours, a combined 110 missiles and nearly 50 drones hit cities from Lviv in the West to Odessa in the South and Zaporizhia near the front lines. In Dnipro, a maternity ward was hit. In Odessa and Lviv, housing blocks were destroyed. Observing the skyline in Kiev, journalists reported plumes of acrid black smoke rising into the cool winter air. Overall, it's thought 55 Ukrainians died in the onslaught, with another 160 injured. Although it was far from the deadliest day for civilians in the war, that grim honor still belongs to the 16th of March 2022, when a Russian strike on a Maripol theater killed around 600. The sheer scale of the barrage made it likely the biggest attack since the one that opened the conflict. It was this brutal bombardment many assumed the Ukrainian strike on Belgorod was meant to avenge, an Old Testament style of justice in which one Russian eye is exchanged for a Ukrainian one. But, and here's the key part, what if 
neither of these strikes was targeting civilians in the first place. This was the conclusion of the British MOD, which wrote on X that, quote, the recent strikes likely primarily targeted Ukraine's defense industry, an assessment backed up by an anonymous Ukrainian source who told The Economist that Moscow had targeted sites where drones and missiles were being produced. Or as the Institute for the Study of War put it, quoting again, Russian strikes against Ukrainian industrial facilities likely aim to prevent Ukraine from developing key capacities to sustain operations for a longer war effort. The MOD also gave the strike on Belgorod a similar assessment, noting the presence of a large ammunition depot that appeared to have been the target. As British officials briefed the Telegraph, the attacks are part of an escalating missile and drone duel between Russia and Ukraine, with both sides bidding to degrade one another's military and industrial capacities. Now, this obviously does nothing to negate the horror of all the dead civilians that we've seen in the last week. However, it does point to a serious tactic both Moscow and Kiev appear to be pursuing. One that got lost in much of the wider coverage. A tactic of focusing all their might onto destroying one another's war machines with long-range strikes. Right now, the land battle has settled into a near stalemate that's killed tens of thousands on both sides and given neither country much to show for it. While the recent focus has been on Ukraine's disappointing counter-offensive, Russia hardly had a better year. According to the Blackbird Group of Analysts, Russia on January 1, 2023, held 18.26% of Ukraine's territory. One year later, on January 1, 2024, it held 18.27%. That means that all this past year of fighting, all that death, all those bombardments, got Putin a mere couple of hundred square kilometers closer to his goal of subjugating Ukraine, a country that's not much smaller than Texas. And while Russian troops have now regained the initiative, Putin's army is so battered that the Blackbird Group thinks a near-term Russian breakthrough is unlikely, even if the West halts aid deliveries, quoting, No collapse of Ukraine is on the horizon. Even with less aid, Ukraine will be able to defend against Russia on the whole front. The quote ends. This has left both countries struggling to find an advantage in other theaters with varying degrees of success. Ukraine, for example, has had a series of remarkable victories in the Black Sea, something we covered in depth on our New Year's Day special. Kyiv also pulled off some spectacular attacks in December, shooting down three hard-to-replace Russian bombers with Patriot missiles and destroying the Rapuha-class landing ship Novichokhsk while it was in port in occupied Crimea. Russia's victories, on the other hand, have mostly taken place on the home front. 2023 saw the Kremlin successfully shift major industries onto a war footing in a way that left the wider West eating its dust. Analysts now estimate Moscow is capable of producing 100 ballistic and cruise missiles each month on top of its artillery production advantage. This surfeit of missiles and evidence of stockpiling had many worried Moscow would try and repeat last year's attacks on energy infrastructure, plunging Ukraine into darkness during its coldest months. Instead, the recent strikes seem to show Russia's determination to hold on to its industrial advantage, primarily by destroying Ukraine's ability to play catch-up. Per the UK MOD again, Russian planners almost certainly recognize the growing importance of relative defense industrial capacity as they prepare for a long war. The quote ends. Hence the targeting of Ukrainian drone manufacturers, a choice likely related to Zelensky's recent promise to build one million drones in 2024. Likely related, too, to Ukraine's plans to increase its defense industrial output sixfold over the next year. In a long conflict, the advantage will go to whoever can damage the opponent's military industrial base while preserving their own. Now, none of this is particularly revelatory. However, it's still worth noting, as it may become the major factor in the Ukraine war across 2024, a shadow conflict to degrade production capacity and set the stage for a renewed military push in 2025. This is why some in the West are now calling for longer-range missiles to be made available to Ukraine, to suppress Russia's current advantage in long-range strike capacity. Writing on X, Poland's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Radoslav Sikorsky, called for, quote, long-range missiles that will enable Ukraine to take out launch sites and command centers. Now to this, he might as well have added ammunition dumps and weapons manufacturing sites. The ability, in short, to ensure Russia's industrial advantage goes up in a puff of acrid black smoke. Now, neat as all this is, we shouldn't assume there was only a single rationale behind the mass casualty barrages that we've seen over the past week. Likely, both Moscow and Kiev were doing more than simply trying to take out enemy assets. The December 29th strike, for example, was incredibly complex. First came a wave of drones, followed by a complex storm of hypersonic cruise and air defense missiles, which targeted multiple cities and was, according to the Times, quote, intended to overwhelm and confuse Ukrainian air defenses. This was followed on January the 2nd, 
by a much more targeted attack that singled out the cities of Kiev and Kharkiv, an attempt to break through by concentrating firepower. On his substack, retired Australian Major General Mick Ryan tied the attacks to the ongoing adaption battle, with the Russians likely eager to test the limits of Ukrainian air defenses to quote him, Ukraine's air defense network, a mesh of Western, Soviet era, and commercial launchers, missiles, C2, sensors, and reporting systems, is now much more capable than it was this time in 2022. The Russians will have been testing to see if this air defense network could be overwhelmed, or at least where there are exploitable weaknesses. The quote ends. The Guardian's Russia correspondent even went further, suggesting Moscow might be trying to force Ukraine to expend its valuable supply of Patriot and NASAMS air defense missiles, quoting, At a time when the US and EU have halted their military aid, leading to a scenario where Ukraine could find itself without air protection. That would raise the dark specter of the Russian Air Force being able to repeat its tactics from Syria and simply carpet bomb cities into submission regardless of civilian fatalities. Thankfully, such an outcome is relatively unlikely, at least in the short term. The UK has just announced delivery of an additional 200 air defense missiles to Ukraine, while NATO this week unveiled plans to manufacture 1,000 Patriot missiles in Europe, some of which will likely be donated to Kyiv. Still, it does go to show the multi-layered thinking that may have gone into Russia's recent air assaults. And we should assume the Ukrainians are likewise considering different factors. Even if the Belarus strike was targeting an ammunition depot, it seems probable Ukraine's generals were counting on destruction in a regional capital to shake Russians out of their sense that the war is a far away thing that they don't need to care about. Then, we left with a rather brutal story, one in which Russia is refocusing its long-range strike capabilities on Ukraine's defense industrial base to maintain its own edge and civilian casualties, well, they can be damned. Sadly, it's a story that may not change much in the next couple of months. With any major military breakthrough unlikely, beyond maybe the Russian capture of Advika, this is really all Kiev and Moscow can do right now. Concentrate on degrading their opponents' war-making capabilities while trying to build their own up, all in the hope of setting conditions for later in the year. This means more large-scale strikes that also kill civilians seem inevitable. What difference they will make to the overall war, though, is something we likely won't be able to discern for months to come. From Ukraine, we're going to move to the African Horn, where recently inflamed tensions between Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's Ethiopia and its international neighbors appear to have found a resolution. On Tuesday, January 2nd, Ethiopia and the Somali Autonomous Breakaway Region of Somaliland jointly announced that they'd produced a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, that grants Ethiopia the use of one of Somaliland's ports. But if that sounds like just another piece of legal paperwork in another barely relevant corner of the world, well, think again, because this particular document might have either just averted major war or actually made it inevitable. So let's begin with a bit of critical context. On November the 17th of last year, we brought you a situationary update to report that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who again is the leading voice of the East African nation of Ethiopia, wanted a port on the nearby Red Sea. On its face, this was a fair enough request. Nations like having seaports. Ethiopia is a nation. Ergo, Ethiopia would like to have a seaport. But the proposition also had a bit of a problem. Ethiopia is landlocked, and none of the nations between Ethiopia and the sea, that's Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia, seemed to have any interest in signing away one of their own ports. Eritrea has a history of conflict with Ethiopia and has little interest in giving back territory that Eritrea gains by becoming independent from Ethiopia. Djibouti already has a very lucrative trade relationship with Ethiopia and handles its current flow of goods for international shipping. Not to mention, they're all maxed out on foreign control over their ports, with the US, China, France, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and several other nations all hosting military bases there. The only other option, Somalia, doesn't even border the Red Sea, and the nearby portions of Somalia that border the nearby Gulf of Aden aren't even under the control of Somalia's central government. With no easy way to get a port by peaceful means, and with Abiy's insistence on describing his desire for a port as being an existential question for Ethiopia, a range of expert analysts, both in and out of the country have contended that Abiy's statements contain an overt threat of violence. Now, on his part, Abiy has publicly denied that he had any intention to invade Eritrea to get a port, or more specifically, the port of a Saab toward Eritrea's southern end. But Abiy's verbal assurances alone haven't been enough to quiet fears of an Ethiopian military push. After all, this is a guy who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, then almost immediately turned around and spent two years waging a war in Ethiopia's Tigray province, in which anywhere from 162,000 to 600,000 people were killed. Then famine spread. War crimes were committed en masse, 
Happy said about his desire for report, if this is going to happen, there will be no fairness and justice, and if there is no fairness and justice, it is a matter of time. We will fight. And although we don't have quite enough time to get into the inner workings of Ethiopian politics today, do check out our recent video on Abiy Ahmed to learn about that, suffice it to say that starting a war of expansion against a foreign nation, especially Eritrea, could end up being a big boost for Abiy's political situation at home. Around the world, the consensus was clear. The port issue could spiral into a much larger problem, and quickly. So when news broke that Ethiopia had reached a preliminary deal with Somaliland, the entire African horn breathed a sigh of relief. The details of that deal are not yet public, but Abiy Ahmed seems particularly happy about it. As his office said in a statement after the fact, the deal will pave the way to realize the aspiration of Ethiopia to secure access to the sea. Abiy's national security advisor, a politician and former ambassador to Eritrea named Redwan Hussein, has suggested that the deal may allow Ethiopia to lease a military base on the Gulf of Aden. Whether that means Ethiopia would gain a second installation after developing a civilian commercial port, or the commercial and military operations would be one and the same is difficult to say. According to Somaliland, though, the deal involves a 50-year lease of 20 kilometers of sea access for the Ethiopian navy. Regardless of the specifics, though, the deal has been heralded as a major victory for the Abiy government, and it's greatly reduced pressure on Eritrea to prepare for war. But there is another side to this geopolitical surprise that we simply must discuss if we want to understand the full implications of this deal. That other side is Ethiopia's negotiating partner. Not the sovereign nation of Somalia, but the autonomous breakaway region of Somaliland. Although it's not been granted the same recognition as Somalia, Somaliland is the picture of stability compared to its neighbor. It's got a fully intact political system, it's got a functioning government, and it produces its own passports and currency. While it's endured ongoing recent disputes against another Somali breakaway region, Puntland, it's been orders of magnitude more peaceful than the parts of Somalia that are still led by Mogadishu. And with Somaliland going on 30 years of independence, it's got the potential to be a real stabilizing force in the region. But what Somaliland has lacked for decades is political legitimacy on the international stage. Foreign governments have refused to grant the territory recognition. NGOs and aid organizations can't work with Somaliland without going through Mogadishu, and years upon years of frustration inside the territory has forced its political leadership and its people to start considering other and more violent routes to survival. From Somaliland's perspective, that's why this deal with Ethiopia is so earth-shaking. On the one hand, it represents the biggest potential foreign investment into Somaliland in several years, bringing international shipping to Somaliland's shores while allowing a pop-up industry to serve Ethiopia's military installation. On the other hand, Somaliland President Muse Bihi Abdi has revealed that the deal includes a major sweetener for his stateless nation, formal recognition by Ethiopia as a sovereign country at an unspecified time in the future. That's a major reversal of fortunes for Somaliland, a country that's long pinned its hopes on the idea that recognition by even one nation could set off a domino effect. The African Union, long opposed to recognizing one new state because of the potential to legitimize dozens of independence claims across Africa, could be swayed by the Ethiopian Declaration. And with the African Union will likely follow the US, the European Union, and even the UN, who in recent years have all preferred to follow the African Union's lead on intra-African affairs. And with that sort of recognition could come a flood of aid, one that has the potential to take one of Africa's most stable democracy-ish entities and elevate it to a much greater status than it's ever had before. The port in question is an established port known as Berbera. It's owned by Somalilands, but operated primarily by an Emirati logistics company called DP World. Currently, it's recognized as Somaliland's commercial capital, with the potential to berth five cargo ships at the time. It's a pretty nice port, all things considered, but it hasn't had quite as much of an impact on the people of Somaliland as they might have hoped. And it's become a waypoint for global maritime trade without any recognition of the independence claims of the territory on which it's located. Turning part of that port over to Ethiopia, or even better, allowing Ethiopia to build out its own facilities, gives Somaliland an invaluable opportunity to realize the port's true potential, both economically and geopolitically. That's not to say that the deal won't have its pitfalls. Ethiopia and Somaliland actually tried something similar to this all the way back in 2018, when Somaliland tried to lease the port at Berbera to a joint partnership between Ethiopia and the Emirati company that currently operates the port, DP World. In that deal, DP World would have owned a majority stake in the port, and Ethiopia would have owned a smaller stake. But that deal fell through in 2022. According to Somaliland, Ethiopia has failed to meet some of its expectations in advance of the deal going through. 
But in light of that prior failure, it's even more notable that Somaliland has chosen to give Ethiopia a second chance, and as far as we know, without direct financial involvement from the Emirates. But there's one group of people who didn't take kindly to word of the deal, and this is where the potential for large-scale conflict begins to open up again. The people in question, of course, are the internationally recognized Somali government, who still assert that Somaliland is a territory rightfully under Mogadishu's control. As one Somali minister put it after the news broke, Somalia is indivisible. Its sovereignty and territorial integrity is uncompromisable. Somalia's official account on X stated, Ethiopia knows well that it can't sign a military pact or MOU to lease support with the regional head of state. That mandate is the prerogative of the federal government of Somalia. Said the nation's president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, Somalia belongs to Somalis. We will protect every inch of our sacred land and not tolerate attempts to relinquish any part of it. Somaliland, you are the northern regions of Somalia, and Ethiopia has no recognition for you. If Ethiopia claimed it gave you recognition, then it is not a recognition that exists. And from the Prime Minister to his nation, I want to assure you that we are committed to defending the country. We will not allow an inch of land, sea, and skies to be violated. We will defend our land with any legal means possible. After the deal was announced, Somalia called an emergency meeting of its cabinet, hoping to arrange some sort of organized response. In Somalia, where political divides run deep and are often settled with bloodshed, the Port Deal announcement has been remarkably effective in aligning the country's leadership, its political elite, and even its opposition. In all likelihood, word of the deal must have been a surprise to the government in Mogadishu. Just last week, Somali state media announced that, with the help of Djibouti, Somalia and Somaliland had agreed to reopen talks in the hope of conflict resolution around their long range of disputes. Now, with an early memorandum of understanding that could very easily morph into a signed enforceable treaty, Somalia's got a problem. In this situation, we do need to stress how important it is to at least understand Mogadishu's position, even if you don't empathize with it. After all, we're talking about a sovereign nation that, without its agreement or consent, would become host to a foreign military base occupied by a foreign military. That prospect is no more welcome when it's Ethiopia stationing troops in Somalia than it is when it's Russia stationing troops in Moldova or Georgia. According to Mogadishu, Somaliland's deal is illegitimate and both the African Union and the United Nations Security Council have a duty to weigh in. Internationally, the deal comes at a rather difficult time in and around the Red Sea as missile and drone strikes by Yemen's Houthi rebel organization continue to cause chaos in global maritime commerce. The addition of a new potential player to the Red Sea in Ethiopia could go one of two ways. It could be a stabilizing force helping to tamp down on Houthi attacks and broader piracy in the region, or it could be a disruptor, depending on how Ethiopia chooses to throw its weight around at sea. An Ethiopian presence on the water could also be a problem for Egypt, long seen as the local nation with the most influence in the Red Sea, and the loss of Ethiopia's payments to use Djibouti's ports could cause a big problem for Djibouti as well. And whether the international community judges a potential Ethiopian port to be a net positive or a net negative, it's going to require a clear international stance either way, where either Ethiopia or Somalia will have to lose ground in response. Whichever way this deal ultimately goes, it's going to have lasting implications for Ethiopian politics and military power, Somaliland's recognition and survival, and Somalia's status as a sovereign nation. Whether a decision by the UN Security Council or by the African Union would even go Somalia's way is an open question. With Mogadishu in chaos and Somaliland's looking nearly cherubic in comparison, the international community could choose to follow Ethiopia's lead and shift their stance towards Somaliland. But Somalia's urgings to the international community have raised the probability that a more concrete ruling on this issue will come down sooner than later, no matter which way the dominoes fall. What Ethiopia would do to ensure its port access, and what Somalia would do to ensure that the situation resolves in its favor, have become urgent questions to answer. And if use of force is the answer, then it's the beleaguered people of Somaliland who are going to be caught in the middle. And in our final story today, uh, we move northward to the countries of Israel and Lebanon, where on Tuesday the 2nd, a senior leader of Gaza's Hamas organization was killed in an Israeli drone strike while on Lebanese territory. The strike represents Israel's highest profile assassination of a senior Hamas leader so far in its months long offensive against Hamas both in and outside of the Palestinian territory of Gaza. This ongoing offensive is in response to Hamas's large scale terror attack against Israel on October the 7th of last year. 
The target of Israel's strike was one Saleh al-Aruri, a key figure in Hamas's leadership who had long had close ties with Hamas's leader inside Gaza, Yawa Sinwar. Aruri lived and worked in Lebanon as the primary intermediary between Hamas and the Lebanese militant and political organization Hezbollah, with whom Hamas shares a common financial and military backer, the nation of Iran. In addition to his ties with Hezbollah, Aruri had significant influence in the handling of Hamas's finances and is believed to have played a role in the 2014 kidnapping and killing of three Israeli teenagers in the West Bank back when he was a Hamas street commander rather than a diplomatic representative. Information on his whereabouts has long fetched a bounty of up to five million US dollars offered by the US State Department, and his role has become all the more important as Hamas and Hezbollah continue to cross coordinate after the October 7th attacks. In recent weeks, Aruri is believed to have been a critical negotiator to arrange the only ceasefire of the Israel Hamas conflict thus far. Aruri was killed in the Lebanese suburb of Dayer, just outside the capital city of Beirut, in a location far from what anybody could consider the front lines of Israel's war in Gaza or its skirmishes with Hamas along Israel's northern border. The strike hit a known Hamas office inside the suburb, killing six people, including Arori and his bodyguards. It was the first assassination of its kind during Israel's ongoing offensive, and it marks a dramatic escalation to the lengths Israel is willing to go in order to fulfill its promise to eradicate Hamas in its totality. Since the start, of Israel's war on Hamas. International analysts have warned repeatedly that the war could very quickly escalate into a broader regional conflict. As we said, Hezbollah and Hamas are friendly organizations to each other, taking direction from a common backer in Iran, and Hezbollah's militants have been more than willing to cause trouble for Israel in low-grade skirmishes along the Lebanese border. Unlike Hamas, Hezbollah is also a political actor inside Lebanon. Its political party, Loyalty to the Resistance, controls 15 of Lebanon's 128 parliamentary seats and is a member of the current ruling coalition. In a practical sense, it's the most powerful political organization inside Lebanon, which itself has been teetering on the brink of failed state status for a couple of years. Seeing the Lebanese government's failure to provide infrastructural and social services to its population, Hezbollah has established its own significantly more robust network of schools, banks, gas stations, and more. Taken together, this combination of factors means that Israel taking action that could be perceived as being against Hezbollah is very different than doing the same against Hamas. Hezbollah has a nation at its disposal, Hamas does not. And by launching a targeted assassination of a close ally of the Hezbollah organization on what Hezbollah perceives as its own territory, very close to the Lebanese capital city of Beirut, well, Israel's attack represents the biggest challenge to its authority by far that Hezbollah has had to deal with since the start of the current war. Making matters worse, Hamas's Alaska TV network has stated that two of Hamas's Lebanese commanders running operations inside Lebanon were killed in the strike, dramatically raising the stakes for Hezbollah as it considers whether or not to respond. Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, said all the way back in August that any Israeli assassinations carried out on Lebanese soil would earn a severe retaliation. In the wake of the January 2nd assassination, Hezbollah posted a statement to Telegram stating that it stands with finger on the trigger, and it condemned the attack as a serious assault on Lebanon that will not go without a punishment or response. Across Lebanon, the response to the strike has been no more hospitable even outside Hezbollah's command architecture. The current Prime Minister, Najib Makati, condemned the act as an Israeli crime and vowed to file a complaint with the UN Security Council. In the West Bank of Ramallah, occupied by Israel, the death of Aruri has kicked off large-scale protests, while in the Houthi-controlled Yemeni capital of Sana'a, protesters have marched in support of Hamas as well. Responding to the public outcry, Hezbollah's leader took to the airwaves on Wednesday the 3rd, declining the opportunity to call for full-scale war, but asserted that if Israel continues to conduct attacks inside Lebanon, that Hezbollah's response will know no limits. In Iran, the killing has been derided as a cowardly terrorist operation, and while it's difficult to tell whether the Iranian response to the assassination will be compounded by or forgotten because of a bombing at the January 3rd memorial in remembrance of a former Iranian Quds Force leader, Qassam Soleimani, the coming days may see Iranian proxy media outlets tie the two acts together to weave a more decisive narrative against Israel and the United States. Notably, Israel has not yet taken direct responsibility for the attack, and one of its primary military spokesmen, Daniel Hagari, refused to directly comment on the incident during remarks on Wednesday. However, Hagari did allude more broadly to the state of affairs in Israel and Lebanon, saying that the IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. When asked directly whether Israel carried out the assassination, Hagari responded, We are focused on killing Hamas. 
Mark Regev, a high-level political advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, was asked to comment on the attack during an interview on MSNBC and responded by emphasizing that Israel had not claimed the attack as its own. Regev continued, But whoever did it, it must be clear, this was not an attack on the Lebanese state. Whoever did this did a surgical strike against the Hamas leadership. Whoever did this has a gripe with Hamas. That is very clear. In this particular case, we can lay aside the idea that some other actor would have used an Israeli drone to kill Hamas commander in Lebanon, especially without Israel's express knowledge and approval. However, Israel's handling of the incident is still important to examine, specifically in its attempt to draw a distinction between this attack against Hamas and what it would mean for the Lebanese state to be attacked directly. The subtext here is that, if possible, Israel would rather not go to war with Lebanon over this particular incident if it doesn't have to. Whether Lebanon and specifically Hezbollah will agree, especially if multiple Lebanese Hamas officials were indeed killed in the strike, is another matter entirely. And outside the Israeli government, not all former officials have kept the party line. A former Israeli envoy to the UN named Danny Danon congratulated Mossad, Shin Bet, and the IDF for carrying out the assassination. If Hezbollah, and with it Lebanon, do get drawn into the war against Israel, the implications could be very, very far-reaching for the entire region. Hezbollah is far better armed than Hamas, with its stockpiles estimated to include well over 100,000 rockets, including precision anti-tank, anti-aircraft, and anti-ship missiles. If the Lebanese armed forces were to get involved directly, they'd bring to bear an additional 80,000 or more active personnel, several hundred tanks, and over a thousand American-made armored personnel carriers, several hundred artillery pieces, a handful of attack planes and helicopters, and several patrol and security boats. Not anywhere near enough to overwhelm the IDF, but more than enough to be a persistent thorn in Israel's side and even launch mass attacks into Israeli territory. Equally important, if not more so, is the potential for a Lebanese entry into the war to draw in the Houthi rebels in Yemen, expanding their military operations beyond just harassing ships in the Red Sea, and to draw in Iranian proxies, the Assad regime in Syria, and potentially even Iran itself. That spectre is one that's long loomed over Israel's operation in Gaza, that once hostilities begin expanding outside the Palestinian territories, they'll cascade into a major war in the region. In recent days, Israel has pulled a full five brigades from the front line in Gaza, comprising several thousand troops. Although those troop movements were initially taken as an indication that Israel might look to scale back its offensive, it's now entirely plausible that they may have been rotated out of Gaza not for rest and replenishment, but to pivot toward Israel's northern border to deter a retaliatory operation from Hezbollah or the Lebanese government in the wake of the Aruri assassination. If those troops are needed, the early indicators will most likely be an uptick in the almost daily skirmishes between Israel and Hezbollah along the border. Those skirmishes, so far, have been limited in number and size. But an escalation in violence may be a harbinger of much larger escalation to come. For now, we'll watch the situation in Lebanon closely and examine the broader Middle East for signs of more trouble to come. In the African Horn, we'll keep a close eye on the spiraling tensions between Ethiopia and Somalia, and on the battlefields of Ukraine, we'll watch for further indications that the scope of the Ukrainian offensive has broadened for the long term. As always, keep you apprised of those developments as they come, as we will for any other conflicts and crisis spots around the world. For now, though, we're signing off. Thanks for being here.